this moment right now. Oh, I've been leading up to this moment right now. Okay, you know what? That didn't go exactly the way. Play that video again. I'll come on again. I'll start again. Okay, don't do that. I'm just kidding. All right. All right. Man, um, this, this series has just been so exciting because we've taken a look at, at heroes that we, that we know and love all throughout our childhood and movies and, and television shows growing up and stuff. And there's, there's always somebody that, that we relate to that, that's not as cool as the superhero guy like Peter Parker is not so cool. And, you know, and, and Clark Kent is sort of a nerd. And, but they get to turn into that superhero because they summon their superpower. And we've been taking a look at real life superheroes that have real life supernatural power. And we've taken a look at heroes in the Bible like Gideon. And Esther, oh, that was a two-week one that, there that was uh, awesome. If you missed any of those, they are available you know, on Facebook and YouTube and stuff like that. Uh, go check those out. We even did last week, we didn't do an actual person, but the hero last week was grace because grace is a power. God's grace, whoo, God's grace defeats sin, man, uh, in, your, in your life. So uh, go check those out if you, if you missed any of them. Man, it's just been a, such an anointed, fun series. Today... It's all been leading up to our greatest hero, and he rose, uh, and that is what we celebrate today. And I'm going to give you guys a little bit different take on Jesus. When you think of the name Jesus, we often think of something um, something else. And today I want to get you to see Jesus a little bit differently than maybe how you see him. I've been seeing him this way for a really long time. So I'm going to hopefully get you to, uh, to, to see some of my favorite scriptures in the Bible that really tell us who this man was when he walked the earth, who this man is as he's still alive to this day. So uh, first things first is we are going to start off with a quote from Jesus himself from Revelation, Revelation 1, 17. Fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore and I have the keys of death and Hades. Now that is a powerful quote. Probably the most powerful quote that's ever been delivered. So I'm going to ask, start off by asking you guys a question. I'm going uh, to ask the guys a question real quick. So fellas, I want you to be honest with me just for a second. If you and I got into a fight, a fist fight, all right? If we got into a fist fight, how many of you guys think y'all could take me? By show of hands, <laughs> Wait, girls can't play. Oh, all right. Look, I, there was like girls all over the room. Like, I got this. Well, that wasn't really supposed to, that's not how that's supposed to go down. All right. Okay. So, so for real. Okay. So, it, like, honestly, okay. So, I'm about, I'm about 195, you know, 6'2, 195. Uh, I've seen Karate Kid in every episode of Cobra Kai, uh, but I, I, I've never really been in real, real fights. A couple times I got punched and wanted to fight back. Uh, that's not how it went down. The uh, coach broke it up before I could throw my first punch. I was excited uh, that he broke it up. Um, so I never, you know, I'm not really a fighter. So. Really, raise your hand if you think if you think you take me, Caden. <laughs> yeah, brother, <laughs> you love it. I love those confidence, brother Billy. Like I got this. Raise your hand if you. My mom, <laughs> mom could take me. Yeah, yeah. I I wouldn't even fight that one. I'd be like, you win, Caleb. Yeah, you could probably Michael. Yeah, that's one of the first hands I saw go up, and I'm like, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I I uh, I got to I got to arm wrestle Michael a couple weeks ago. Um, and by I got to arm wrestle Michael, I went like this and walked away. Um, but uh, that, was, that was fun. Uh, who, who else could take me? Who else could take me? Wyatt back there could take me. Jesse. Jesse could take me. Stephen. Stephen could definitely, could definitely. Sarah? 
Oh, Isaac, okay. Sarah, all right. Sarah might could take me. Kendall could probably uh, take me. Isaac, yeah. Who over here? CW can take me. OD back there could probably take me. Michael, look, I love y'all's, y'all's confidence. <laughs> Marion, I got it, got it. All right. So uh, I want you guys to know also that uh, it really doesn't, doesn't offend me that, you know, that you think that you think you can take me. You probably you're probably right. Um, I mean, you can think what you want. Um, I don't know. I, I, was, I guess I was a little offended that you know that Tamar and and Layla and you know Sarah and the girls were like, okay, easy. But but it doesn't really bother me um, that that you know that y'all think you could beat me up. Uh, but what does bother me? There is something that does bother me, and I, it's bothered me for years. And it is how much we underestimate the power of Jesus. You can underestimate me all day long. You can overestimate me all day long. But we underestimate the power of Jesus all the time. And I wanted to introduce you today to another side of Jesus. When you hear the name Jesus, what do you often think of? Especially like the world's view of Jesus. When you hear the name Jesus, what do you think of? You think of a painting. We've seen paintings of Jesus, and they paint Jesus. I, I, I get, it bothers me how people paint Jesus. Like, you see a picture of Jesus, and you're like, what? He's, he's always like this just super over-the-top, compassionate, loving, like little skinny. He's skinny and kind of hippie-looking, um, and he's always petting the sheep, you know, and like, like he does have a compassionate side to him, of course. He is super loving and compassionate. But my goodness, that's just one small side of Jesus. The world sees Jesus as this weak, fragile, frail, just overly compassionate, loves butterflies and rainbows and and he's this skinny man hanging up on the cross. That's how the world sees him. And he's nice and cuddly. And, and most folks picture a guy with, with long, flowing, blondish hair. When did Jesus get blonde hair? <laughs> right? <laughs> Pretty sure he lived in the Middle East, you know. But uh, he had blonde hair. I don't know. Did he pet sheep? Maybe he pet. Have you all ever seen a picture of Jesus petting sheep or holding a lamb? That's not even in the Bible. I've read the whole thing, all the New Testament, all the Gospels. Never is there one scripture where Jesus is petting a sheep. <laughs> but but every picture that we have of him, that's what is is depicted. But there's a whole other side that doesn't get talked about that much. But Jesus talks about this other side all the time. Most of The time when Jesus refers to himself or he's talking to people in general, he's talking about power. Most of the time, Jesus himself is not talking about sweetness and kindness and gentleness and and love and compassion. Now, don't hear what I'm not saying. That, of course, is, of course, that's the side of Christianity. They'll know we're Christians by our love. But Jesus himself, oh my goodness gracious, he talked about power. He is a force to be reckoned with. And I tell y'all all all the time, in my own little vernacular, Jesus was bad. Like, Jesus was not this little feeble, like, and what man in the world wants to follow that? Nobody wants, there's not a man alive that wants to follow a king that says, you just be a good boy. You be a good boy. Nobody wants to follow that. That's what mamas tell their little, little baby boys all the time. Be a good, aren't you a good boy? Boys don't want to be a good boy. Boys want to be bad. We want to be strong. We want to be destroyers. We want to hunt and kill and, you know, play sports and stuff, you know. We don't want to fall down when we try to pick up the kickball. <laughs> Had a kickball fiasco I told you all about last week. We got, a game, we got a good game of kickball going yesterday, too, at the, at the Easter egg hunt. How many of y'all came to the Easter egg hunt? Yeah? Wasn't that so much fun? That was a blast. I had so much fun, man. It was, it was cool. And uh, 
I, st- I, I started just because I love it. I, I jumped in there with, with kickball, and I, I, I kicked, kicked, and I, I ran the bases one time, and I was reminded real quick, you remember what happened last week when you tried to play kickball, right? I fell down. I fell down hard, right? It was ugly. Right? So I was like, okay, no, no, no kickball. But, but that, men want to be strong because that's how God made us because that's how God is. Jesus is not some little, feeble, skinny, sheep-petting <laughs> Savior. He is awesome and strong. And everybody loves talking about the mercy side of Jesus and the love side of love everybody type of Jesus. And, you know, and yeah, that's in there. But, I'm, but today, Jesus is super, super powerful, and I'm going to show it to you. We're going to go through, we're going to look at some scriptures in Matthew. You can turn there if you want. I'm not really going to have anything else up on the screen no scriptures. A lot of times I have every scripture, but I'm just going just gonna to show you some of my favorite, most powerful things that Jesus said to get you to understand today the supernatural power that, that Jesus spoke about all the time that we just don't often think about. But Easter is a time that we celebrate this power, like the quote that we started with. Because when people paint such a weak picture of Jesus, it causes us to be weak, his followers. Because we're, we're supposed to be like Jesus. And so if we think Jesus is weak, it makes us fear our situations. It makes us fear our problems. And it, it, it leaves us with a weak mindset. We lose sight of how powerful he is. So we're going to start with Matthew 4. Okay, so if you don't know the Bible too well... There's four books in the Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that just tell the story of Jesus' life. These are the the four Gospels of Jesus' life when he was alive on this earth. And they are the four books that he actually spoke. So there's no other books in the Bible except Revelation. He spoke a little bit um, where Jesus is actually speaking. So in Matthew 4 is where we start. Jesus starts his public ministry. The very first thing he did was one of the most powerful things that anyone could ever do. The first thing that he did publicly before he started, before he started his public ministry, the first thing he did was fasted for 40 days. That right there takes a beast. 40 days? I mean, the longest that I've ever gone without food is 21. 21 days. I've done that several, several times, absolutely zero food, 21 days of prayer and fasting. That's about all I got. At the end of that 21 days, I mean, seriously, like it is empowering. If y'all never fasted before, it is so empowering. Uh, and and we, do, we do messages and teachings on it and stuff. But, I mean, let's be real, right? <laughs> At the end of that 21 days, whoo, Pastor John called me one time. We were doing one together one time, and, and he called me, and he was like, man, could I just, could I have a cup of chicken broth? <laughs> I'm like, brother, that's your fast. If, it's your fast. If, if, if you think God says it's okay for you to have some chicken broth, it's not food. I mean, it's not solid food. And he's like, I, I think God will be all right with that. And, uh, you know, and I'm like, oh, yeah, I bet God's all right with that, man. God loves you. And so, so uh, he did. And so he called me later. I was like, so how, how was the chicken broth? I'll never forget. He goes, it was like a steak dinner. You remember that? <laughs> that was awesome. That was great. Man, you get after 40 days, at his weakest, after 40 days, at, at, at Jesus' weakest, Satan comes to tempt him. In Matthew 4.10, and Jesus said to Satan, get away from me, Satan. Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And the devil left. At Jesus' weakest point, he's more powerful than Satan. At his weakest, you know Jesus wanted some food. And Satan tempted him with food. You know you could have bread. It's right here. You're the son of God. Have some bread. And Jesus said, get away from me. And Satan did not stick around. He obeyed and he left. In chapter 5, he goes straight to the religious leaders. These are the guys that everybody looks up to. These are the ones that are supposed to have everything right. He goes right up to them, saying to the people, unless your righteousness exceeds these guys, you're never going to enter the kingdom of heaven. I tell you, 
All right, this is uh, verse 20. Chapter 5, 20. If you're writing scriptures down, I'll, I'll let you know what they are as we go. And y'all can do some studies later if, for those of y'all that like to do that. For I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the scribes, the leaders of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. He's going straight up. You know what he's saying right there? He's going straight up to the, 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 the guys that are above everything, that everyone looks up to, the religious leaders. And he's telling everybody, if y'all's righteousness ain't at least as good as theirs... Y'all ain't going to go to heaven. You know what he's saying to the Pharisees? Y'all are going to hell. He, I mean, he don't make no bones about it. These are the guys that are in charge of everything. I'm telling you, Jesus was bad. He didn't care what you thought of him. He knows he's right. Because he knows he's got a superpower that nothing will stop. And he walks right up to him. He's like, y'all think you got it going on, but let me tell you something. You don't. Y'all are going to hell. That's a bold statement. Right in front of everybody. Says it in public. Then later in chapter 6, he goes after the rich. He says, you can't serve two masters. You can't love money and love the Lord. Just come follow me. This is such a great, powerful message. Just come follow me. Don't even worry about your stuff. Don't worry about what you're going to eat tomorrow. I'll take care of it. What a great message for the rest of us when we worry about stuff. Don't even worry about it. I'll take care of it. Just put your trust in me and everything else will be added unto you. In chapter 7, he's telling the people that some of you, even though you go through the motions, you might look religious. He's saying, I know your heart. I know what's really going on. And in the day of judgment, I'm going to say, depart from me because I never knew you. Y'all know that scripture in Matthew 7? That's a rough one. That's a rough one. Now, some of y'all might already be like, wait, this is Easter. Why? I just kind of thought we would come to church today and get all dressed up, and, and Pastor would do a little nice little message, and he'd have a little bunny pop out of a box, and we go eat later, and, you know. Well, I mean, you, yeah. I mean, we, we could give you that side of it. We could give you that part of it. But, man, I, I don't want a little bunny hopping Jesus. I want somebody that can change my life, man. I want somebody that's bad. I want somebody that's powerful. I want somebody that can look my issues and my problems and my deepest, darkest secrets and my sin and my filth and my fears. And I want somebody that's powerful enough to look that stuff straight in the face and say, you can't have that one. That's my kid. That one belongs to me. Away from him. Because Jesus will fight on your behalf. There's been so many battles I can't win on my own. Thank you, God, that you sent your son to do battle for me. And you got to know, at his weakest moment, he's more powerful than anything that Satan can throw your way. That's my king. And he is a force to be reckoned with. He ain't no little skinny, sheep petting weakling. That's not who we serve, man. And he ain't got nothing to do with bunny rabbits. <laughs> it says when he said this, the crowds were stunned. Who is this guy? Because he speaks with authority. They've never heard someone speak with the authority of God. And you, oh, and you remember what happened in chapter 8. We preached on this a, couple, uh, a few weeks ago. I kind of jumped the gun a little bit. We did one, we did one message of heroes on Jesus. Because I'm like, oh, I, we just have to jump into Jesus. Uh, but in chapter 8 is when, when they were in the boat. Jesus went in the boat with the disciples. And the storms came up. You remember that, that story? The storms came up. And, and the winds and the waves, the sea was just a tossing that boat all kinds of ways. And they got super scared. They thought they were going to drown. The Bible says they were so terrified they thought they were going to drown. Where's Jesus? Sleeping. He's asleep. Because that doesn't worry him. And they woke him up. Master, master, do you not care about us? We're going to die. I mean, it doesn't say this, but I can just imagine Jesus going, What? What? what are y why are y'all so upset? We're going to die. The winds, the waves, the sea. I, he was like, huh? Y'all woke me up for that? 
brother tired, man. I've been saving the world. Why are y'all scared you're going to die? You're with the author of life. Are you nuts? And so he wakes up. And he just speaks. It doesn't say, the Bible doesn't say he did this magical potion. He spun around three times and did a dance and sang a song. He just said, be still. And the winds went, and the waves flattened out. And the disciples were like, whoa. I mean, we knew he was pretty awesome. But they again said, who is this guy that even the weather and the ocean obey his commands they're still trying to figure out this power they've never seen this power at the root of what they're mystified by is the word power that's why it we have to end this series of heroes talking about the powerful side of jesus the power of our lord and then when he gets to the shore where he's going in gatherings we talked about this too when he gets there there's this demon-possessed guy. And in Matthew, it actually records there being two. There's this demon-possessed guy that everyone's afraid of. No one can even do anything with him. He's been chained, and bam, and he breaks his chains, and he's just crazy. Demons instantly recognize who that is. And they start trembling. And they say, Son of God, what do you want with us? Can you imagine being the disciples? When you just saw this guy do this, and then you get there, and some crazy, wigged out demon comes up to you and instantly bows and says, Son of God, what do you want from us? Surely you're not here to torment us yet. It's not the time, is it? They already know. He's fixing to just dance all over them. They ain't got a prayer. They know they are beneath the feet of Jesus. They know that their destiny is to be completely tormented by the Son of God. Crushed. Because he already crushed. He already crushed Satan. He already crushed that serpent. But the best is yet to come. But they already know how the story ends for them. And they can't. Is it time? Is it already time? What are you doing here, son of God? That's some trippy stuff. That is, that's power. That is crazy power. What does that tell you about Jesus? I don't know what you think about when you hear the name Jesus, but the demons tremble when they hear the name Jesus. They, they just, they shudder. And then the city comes out when they saw that power, and they were, they were freaked out too. And they didn't want it, did they? If you read in chapter 8, they didn't want it. Like they, they begged him to leave. Why would they beg him to leave? We talked about it a little bit. There's a whole other perspective that we didn't talk about. They begged him to leave because they didn't want this kind of wind and waves and, and you, the demons even know who you are. We like our lives just how they are. Don't interrupt our lives. We don't want that kind of power. Does that hit home with anybody? Sometimes, oftentimes... We don't embrace and accept the true power of Jesus because we kind of like our lives the way way it is. I don't really want to be confronted with with some of that. I know I'm not uh, this area of my life, uh, but I I don't want to be confronted with that. So we don't fully embrace the power of Jesus. Because if you fully embrace the power of Jesus, no eh, part of your life will last. (laughs) And sometimes, I, I, don't, I don't want you to mess with, I like the way that it is. And I'm good. I'm good. And that's what these people, they were scared. They're like, oh, we don't want none of that. We don't want none of that power. Everything is fine the way that it is. Chapter 10, verse 28. This is empowering to all of us. Chapter 10, 28. He tells us, do not... Be afraid. Now, hang on. Before I say this scripture, this is going to be one of the hardest ones to hear all day. But it is so empowering, you guys. And I can't be a pastor that just skips over the stuff that's hard, right? I don't think y'all want me to be that kind of pastor, do you? 
that let's just let's just brush this let's just brush these scriptures i don't that's not a popular message right there i don't let's let's brush these scriptures under the rug let's skip over those and sugarcoat the bible and kind of water it down so it makes us feel good do you want that kind of pastor i don't want to be that kind of pastor but some of this stuff is a little bit hard but this the power of jesus though is what changes our lives the power of Jesus, getting rubbed the wrong way every once in a while is what makes you become a better man, makes you become a better woman, a better parent, better mom, better dad, better sibling, a better kid to your parents. That's what, that's, that's embracing the power of Jesus. It says, do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one, capitalized one, he's talking about himself, But rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both body and soul in hell. What he's saying is, there's no reason for any of us to be afraid of people. I ain't afraid of you. There's no reason for us to be scared of anyone that could just kill the body. But rather, you should fear the one who can sends you to hell. Oh, it's quiet in here. Oh, nobody likes to talk about that, Jesus. Everybody wants to go back to the bunnies, Pastor. Please pet a sheep. <laughs> Jesus loves me. This I know. It's my little Jesus in a box. He's so wonderful. Jesus is, he's, he's so compassionate and loving. You guys, I bet if, if, if a sheep ran across Jesus' path, he would scoop him up and he would just love on him and then he'd let him go out. He's, you can have your little Jesus in a box. There's just another side. Amen. And some of us today don't need the little mm, Jesus. We need the power. We need the power. And, and what this is saying Y'all, don't be afraid of what people think of you. How many of us live our lives in fear of what people think? How many times do I shift my message that I'm going to preach to you based on what they might think? I try not to do that, but we all do stuff like that. Why I I, I shouldn't do this because what what will they think? Well, I don't... I don't know, what will they think of me if I, if I try? Or, or what will I think of myself? If I try and fail, that'll be embarrassing. So I'm not going to get out there. Even, even little stuff like sports. You know, oh, I'm not going to get out there and play football. I'm not very good and I'll just embarrass myself. What does that mean? It means you care what they think of you. There's no reason. You don't, who cares? So you fumble the ball. So you... You know, the quarterback throws it to you, and it's up to you to to score the touchdown, and your team loses, and you drop the ball. So what? Don't be afraid of people. They can't do anything. If you die, don't be afraid of people. What's the worst they can do? Kill you? That's a win. (laughs) That's what he's saying. Do you understand the power of the the one who's speaking this? So what if they kill you? What's the worst that's going to happen? Like, I'm like, okay, should I preach this message on Easter? And then I'm like, what's the worst that's going to happen? You're going to send me an email? I, you know, I'm like, man, this is the power, though. And I like the power. That's the guy I want to follow, man. One of my favorite movies is Braveheart. Another one of my favorite movies is Gladiator. Like, I, if I'm at home by myself, when that ever happens, uh, and I'm going to sit down and watch a movie, I don't even remember how, what that's like, but, uh, but if I'm ever going to do that, I'm not turning on Steel Magnolias. I will not be watching The Notebook. I'm not going to be curled up with some popcorn, getting my blanket all snugged in, ready for some, <laughs> for some you know, the, uh, pretty woman. I mean, you know, I'm not... I'm not doing that. If I ever have that moment, what movie are we going to watch? What movie are you going to watch, fellas? Braveheart. Goose. What? Tombstone. That's what I'm talking about. I'm your Huckleberry. Tombstone. Right? Top Gun. You know? Yeah. That's what. 
<laughs> All right. Power. Power. Then Jesus speaks to whole cities when they still don't believe. He speaks to whole cities in verse 24. He says, it'll be more tolerable for you. I'm sorry, it'll be more tolerable for Sodom on the day of judgment than for you. He speaks to whole cities. I did all this stuff for you, and you still don't believe? Let me tell you something. It's gonna, on the day of judgment, it's going to be more tolerable for, for the city of Sodom than it will be for you. You remember what I did to Sodom? They have it good compared to what's going to happen to you. He's just flat out walking up to people telling them this stuff. Because he wants us to understand. He ain't playing. He wants to understand this is life and death, you guys. This isn't just feel-good stuff. This is, this is life and death. This is the power to overcome the darkest stuff in your life. He's got the answers. He's got the keys. This is Jesus. In chapter 12, the religious leaders, he's after them again. He's confronting them again. They're getting mad at Jesus and the disciples because they're picking grain on the Sabbath. And Jesus makes this statement. In chapter 12, he says, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. Like, what are you doing? They're confronting, you shouldn't do any work on the Sabbath. And he goes, first of all, you got to understand, I'm the one that made that rule. I made that up. Yeah, it was me. And I did it for you. I did it because I don't want man working seven days a week and getting all stressed out. You need to rest. I don't want you being like that, stressing out over things. And now you're telling my disciples, we've been out doing all this work. They've been saving people, doing my work, and they're hungry, and they picked grain and ate it. And you're getting on them about that because it's the Sabbath. You're missing the whole point of the Sabbath. He's challenging the religious leaders of the day. And he says, and besides that, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. No one's ever talked like this before. No one's ever stood up to these guys like that. In chapter 13, verse 40. Matthew 13, 40. He's talking to these folks again. He says, As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man, he's referring to himself, the Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out his kingdom, everything that causes sin, and all who do evil. They will throw them into the blazing furnace, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then they're righteous. Then the righteous will shine like the sun of the kingdom of their father. Whoever hears, let them hear. What is he saying? Y'all better get it right, man. That's what he's saying. He's like, there's coming a time when I'm going to come. When I come back, I'm not, com- not going to look like this. I'm not coming back like this. You, what you see right now, no, no. When I come back, it'll be glory. When I come back, there'll be angels all around. And gather folks up. There'll be a weeding out. I didn't write this. This is Jesus. I didn't write this. There'll be this weeding out from the righteous and then those that cause sin and all who do evil. The power. He's telling them what's at stake. He just keeps trying to tell them and trying to tell them and trying to tell them. In chapter 14, he's walking on the water. Remember when he called Peter onto the water? He's walking on water. They're terrified. He says, don't worry, it's just me. In fact, as long as you focus on me, you can walk on water too. And he does, doesn't he? He gets out of the boat and walks on water. That's power. He's defying physics all over the place. He's showing us a power that the world has never seen before. We just sometimes have such a hard time embracing that much power. Chapter chapter 15, verse 12. This is great. This is so great. See, ah, the Bible's funny, too. Jesus has a sense of humor, right? <laughs> Chapter, Matthew 15, 12, after confronting the Pharisees again, he's getting on them again. The disciples come. They come to him, and they say, Hey, Jesus, do you know that the Pharisees were offended at what you said? I mean, Jesus is just tearing down their whole platform. He's kicking stuff up, turning it upside down. And the disciples come like, the Pharisees? You know, the guys that he just said, you're going to hell because you think you're more righteous than anybody else and you're just praying to show off how good of a prayer you are. The disciples said, "Um, you, you offended them. And Jesus said, 
oh, I didn't mean to offend and I'm sorry. No. No, he didn't. He didn't. That's what the little lamb petting Jesus might would have said. But this Jesus said, leave them alone. They're blind. And they're guiding other people who are blind. If the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. Leave them alone. Like, so what? He doesn't care that they're offended. How often do we change our course because somebody might have got offended? How often do we not share Jesus with somebody because we're afraid they might get offended? How often do we not come up to worship or change our thought process because of what others might say? And he says, don't, don't worry about getting offended. Chapter 16, he told Peter, upon this rock I'll build my church. And, he, and Peter called him Christ. And Jesus said, you know what? You were right to call me Christ. And I will build my kingdom. And the gates of hell will not stop me. He's just going power after power after power. All the darkness and all the power that Satan has will not stop me. Do you understand how powerful I am? Chapter 18 about unforgiving, the master has condemned him. Chapter 18, 34. This is when there's an issue of unforgiveness. The wicked servant, the master is saying to the wicked servant, I canceled all your debts because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on, on the guy that owed you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all that he owed. And then Jesus said, this is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother and sister. I mean, that is, that's harsh. Forgiveness. It's so easy. But Jesus is saying, hey, this guy just got put in jail and tortured. And if you don't forgive other people, that's exactly how God will treat you. I was like, that's harsh, man. That's, that's power. But you guys, please, I'm begging you today on Easter Sunday. You might have thought you were coming to church just for a nice little feel-good message. But today's the day that your life can be changed forever. Because maybe you're carrying unforgiveness in your heart. And maybe that's your problem. Maybe you're like, man, why haven't I not been promoted at my job? Why is my marriage just falling apart? Why can't I get past this, this ceiling? I just keep trying to break through. And the addictions are just too much. And I can't break through. Do you have unforgiveness in your heart? Most likely. I mean, I ask that of myself all the time. Is there anybody that, that I, need, I still need to forgive God? And, and, and pray that dangerous prayer that David prayed. God, show me any wickedness inside of me. Show me anything that's displeasing to you. Show me, God, so that I can, I can change, so that I can grow. Got to get real with God. But if you ask him to show you, he'll show you. But that's okay. I want to step up. I want to level up. God, show me this unforgiveness. And when he shows you, you know what? I, you have unforgiveness towards your dad. Or you have unforgiveness towards your ex. You have unforgiveness towards your kid. You have unforgiveness... Toward, you know, whatever. If he shows you that, if God has ever shown you that and then you obeyed God and you went and asked forgiveness, isn't it such a freeing encounter? It's just like this weight is lifted and you can break through that ceiling and move forward. Your marriage is now free to grow because you've built the solid foundation. Your career and your finances are free to grow because you built a solid foundation. That's what he's saying right here. He tackles every issue, and he speaks right to it, making no bones about it. And in chapter 20, you really start to see his power. Chapter 20, he tells them, we are going to Jerusalem. This is verse 18, 2018. We are going to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified, and on the third day, he will be raised to life. He's telling them the most ultimate power. I am going to let them kill me. 
And they are in such disbelief, they cannot comprehend this kind of power. Can you really comprehend this kind of power today? We show movies and do music and to try to get us to understand. But even the passion of the Christ doesn't do it justice. This, this guy, like they, they killed him. They made sure he was dead. They put him in a tomb, made sure it was closed. He was dead, 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 dead. They stabbed him, making sure of it. And he came back to life. Like, I know we've heard this story, but let that sink in. And he knew it was going to happen when he started his ministry. And he spoke like somebody that knew he had that kind of power. Oh, and the most beautiful thing is that when he ascended, he told all of us, you have that power too. All of that power, he says, I give to you. You will do even greater things than I have done. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives inside you. That is your superpower. But how, do you, how can you possibly think that you are bad? Oh, I'm bad. Oh, I got power you ain't seen before. This job ain't nothing. That remark that person just made to me ain't nothing. Oh, that scar that girl tried to hand me when I was 18, that ain't nothing. Oh, this, that ain't not, you can't walk around like that if you think you serve somebody that don't have that kind of power. What good does it do you to say the same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in me if you don't really recognize how powerful that is and how powerful this man is? Your image of Jesus is this little tiny thing that's been painted on a wall somewhere. You got it wrong. Jesus was bad. Oh, man, this boy was bad. He was strong. I mean, a force to be reckoned with. The greatest power that's ever walked the face of this earth. That's who we're celebrating today. And that power lives in you. He tells them, they're gonna, I'm going to let them kill me. Yeah, I, I could destroy them. But I came for this reason, to die for you. I'm going to take it. I'm going to let them smack me around, torture me, spit on me, ridicule me. You should be the one being crucified for all the stuff that you did. But I am going to take it for you. And then after they kill me, I'm going to get up. I'm going to walk. And I'm going to keep preaching. Because that's just how powerful I am. And in chapter 21, if you think Jesus is a wimp, he makes a whip. And he goes into the temple and drives everybody out that is disgracing his father's house. He's, I'm not letting that happen. I'm not afraid of you. He walks in to the temple where people are disgracing his father's house and taking advantage of his people. And he just starts flipping over tables, smacking everybody around, and drives them. I said, you can't do that in my father's house. He stands up for what is right. You can't do that kind of thing if you don't first know, what do I have to be afraid of them for? What's the worst they can do? And you're like, well, yeah, he's Jesus. So if he dies, he just goes to heaven. Hello? Hey, you don't, I mean, how can you walk in fear if you really comprehend this power? And later in that chapter, in verse 42 and, and 44, he says, the, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. He's talking about himself. I, I'm rejected by these religious leaders. The stone that they rejected, they're going to soon find out, is the cornerstone of the whole thing. Therefore, I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. Anyone who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and anyone on whom this stone falls will be crushed. And what he's telling them, look, you don't want to mess with me. I'll tell you right now, you don't want to mess with me. You try to follow me, it's like China hitting a rock. It'll be shattered. And if I fall on you, I will crush you. That's what he's saying. That's better than any line in the whole movie Gladiator. That's better than any line I saw in Braveheart. That is awesome, but we just don't focus on like he was so bold. I mean, he flat, he's just, we don't see that side of Jesus. We're like, well, that's, that's not very nice. No, it didn't. Oh, one of my favorite things to, to challenge people on is people tell me all the time, because you're a Christian, you have to be nice to everybody. Thank you, who said, who said that? 
No, you, Marissa said that. Of course, Marissa said that, right? We're not shocked. We're not shocked Marissa said that, right? No, you're right. No, you don't. You should be nice, loving, and kind to those who are part of the expansion of God's kingdom and will accept and hear God's word. You should reach out with love and kindness to absolutely everyone in your, in your power that you can. There are times when people will reject it flat out, will they not? They'll flat out reject it. And they'll take advantage of God. They'll use his name in vain. They'll blast him and slash him. And we need to stand up to that. That's what this is saying. Oh, you come against me and I will crush you. That's what this is saying. He's strong. He's not letting that happen. He's not letting them talk, to, talk about his father like that. No way. He calls them hypocrites. They're like, they're like whitewashed tombs that have been painted on the outside, but inside. He's looking straight at them. He goes, inside you? Oh, you get all dolled up. Oh, look at your robe. Look at your sparklies. Oh, don't you look great. Inside, there's death and decay. There's dead bodies inside. You're like a tomb. And he looks straight, straight at them and says this stuff. When you hear the name of Jesus, what is it that you think of when you hear that name? Hopefully you think of power. Hopefully you think just how strong he is. When the Son of Man comes, I will come in my glory and all the angels will be with me. I will sit On a glorious throne and all nations will be gathered. You guys, he's telling of a power that we've never seen before. When I come, when I come back, it doesn't say I'm going to bring a couple angels with. I'm bringing all the angels with me. I'm bringing hundreds of millions of angels, and I'm going to sit on a throne at the end of time. This is how we're going to see him. We're not going to see him like the paintings. When we see him, that's the image we're going to see. I hope you have that image in your head now after hearing this. I hope you have that image next time you're facing something at your job or, or at work or in your mind or, or is something impossible in your life. I hope you understand you have an army of angels being commanded by your heavenly Father that lives inside of you at your disposal for you to command that will obey even the demons recognized who this was, who this guy is. At Jesus' weakest moment, he's more powerful than any darkness in your life. That's my king. That's my king. You guys... All it takes to recognize this power. It takes two things. That's all it takes. Number one is just believe it. It's so simple. Just believe it. That's it. The guy on the cross hanging next to Jesus got to go to paradise. The criminal hanging on. He's not taking a Bible study class. He didn't bring any tea yesterday to the egg hunt. He didn't help. Doesn't do nothing. He got to go with Jesus into paradise. Why? Two things. He believed who this man was next to him and how powerful he was. But it doesn't just take belief. The demons believe who Jesus is. The second one is the most important one. He surrendered. He surrendered. This man is not just who he says he is. This man is someone that I am going to embrace and accept as Lord of my life. Because I know when I do, I escape the darkest parts of the universe. I escape hell, death, and the grave. I get brand new life. I get resurrected. And you guys, it's not just when, you, when your body wears out. You get resurrected now. You get brand new life now. You get a brand new perspective now. You get doors opened now. You have someone walking beside you and inside of you through everything you're going through right now. He's there for you. You have access to this supernatural power inside of you right now. 
I'm going to call our, our praise and worship team back up on the stage. We're going to close up today. But you guys, I want you guys to know that this guy that we've been talking about and celebrating is here, alive, in you. They really did kill him. They tortured him, stripped him of his identity, and they mocked him. Oh, king of the Jews. They put a crown on him of thorns and just smushed it on his head. And they took, they took a, a stick and put it in his hand so he could look like a king. And they, it says they bowed down and said, oh, king of the Jews, look at you now. You said you would destroy this temple. That, that it would destroy the temple and bring it back, build it back up in three days. And they were mocking him because he said that. He's like, if you destroy this temple, I'm going to raise it back up in three days. And now look at you. Now look at you, Jesus. They're so foolish. He was talking about himself. You destroy this temple, he was predicting his resurrection. You can you, go on and kill me. Go ahead. The only way I can prove to you this power is if you do kill me. I have to die so that you fully understand the power that I'm talking about. That I'm not just saying it. It's not just stories that you hear about. It's true. It's real. And it's available to you. It's power. And so on that morning... The ladies went to the tomb and they saw what was going on there. And in chapter 28, they're there and the angel says to them, he's not here. And I love this part. In chapter 28, verse 9, they start running. The girls start, start running. And Jesus comes up to them. So the women hurried away after the angel said he's not here. The tomb is empty. The women hurried away from the tomb and yet filled with joy, they ran to tell the disciples. Suddenly Jesus came out to meet them and Jesus said, greetings. <laughs> he got a sense of humor. All this stuff just happened. The stone has been rolled away. The salvation of the world is here. He's just proven this power that surpasses anything in the world. And he walks up to this girl, these girls and he goes, how y'all doing? Like, bam, greetings. And he tells them to go gather everybody up. And they do. They gather everybody up. And the last thing that he says to us, don't you think it's probably pretty important? The last thing Jesus says to us, I got to read to you. He gathers everybody up. And he says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And then he sends them out with that authority. Now you take this and go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I will be with you always to the very end of the age. Jesus did not say, come, follow me, and I'll lift you up a little bit. Follow me and pick out certain parts of the Bible that work for you and just focus on those. Jesus says, all authority given to me, I give to you. Therefore, you go out and you make disciples. Baptize people. He don't want just kind of, sort of. He wants full submersion. Immersion in that water. He wants you covered from head to toe. Not sticking your toe in the swimming pool because it's kind of cold and you're not sure. Diving in, baptized in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit. And teach them to obey everything I've commanded. Don't teach them to have, feel good about themselves. Teach them to obey. Show them everything. That's why I had to deliver this message today. I couldn't just deliver a nice, feel-good, little pet-the-sheep message, you guys. Teach everyone how to obey everything. And there's so much more to this story than just the, the little sparkles that we hear about all the time and the paintings that we hear about all the time. 
This man was the most powerful man that ever walked the face of this planet, and he did it for you. And it's yours today, and it's available. Let's all stand up. Thank you, Dustin. Let's all stand up. Because our king is worthy of standing for, don't you think? So listen, this is what we're going to do. All right? I don't, don't, don't go yet. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to release you here in just a second and spend the rest of your day with your families and eating and stuff like that. But if you rush out to the restaurants right now, you're just going to have to sit there and wait anyway. All right? All right? So we're not going to stay, stay long. But I, I want to give you an opportunity to respond to the Lord. Brother Ray is going to come up here with our altar team. And all the altar team is just people that are going to pray with you. They just want to pray with you. That's it. We're going to sing a song. And we're going to sing, sing the songs that, that we said, the hymnals that we sang. But you guys, as we sing, if you're here today and you've never received this power before, you've heard something today that you're like, man, I have never thought of it like that before. I got to get me some of that. Come get you some. These folks are not magical or anything, but they will help you pray. And the Bible tells us to get with people to pray. Don't do stuff by yourself. Do it with folks. There's more power there. And these folks are full and they can lead you. But more importantly than leading you into, into a prayer and making your life right with the Lord, they can also help you if you need something else. If you've never given your heart to the Lord and you want to believe in Jesus and you want to surrender to Jesus, you're going to need some help in the next couple of weeks. How do you even know how to read your Bible? We'll help you read your Bible. Because it, it can be complicated, but it is the most incredible thing ever if you learn how to read it. All right, we can show you how to have a life that's full of strength, how to walk with this new superpower. You, you're, you're, just, you're about to receive a power that you, is, is beyond anything you've ever known before. So you've you got you to gotta learn how to use it. All right? So whether you've never received Jesus before in your life, if that's you, I want you to come forward when we start singing. And pray with these folks and give your heart, give your life to the Lord. Or if you just need a resurrection in your life. I have been off track and I got to get myself together. You said something today that I know God is tugging at me and it is time to level up. I got to get this thing right. And you need to get back on track. I want you to come forward too and receive some prayer. If you've never been baptized before, and you're like, man, I want to do that whole full, under, washed, covered let come pray let one of these know and we'll get you baptized we'll get you on our list when we have our next baptism which the weather's beautiful it's time we're going to be having this thing soon all right let them know so we'll reach out to you and let you know when that's going to be you guys this is your moment don't rush it let's go to god in prayer father god we love you and we praise you tug on the hearts of those to respond to your word right now. It's between you and God, church. Nobody else. Who cares who's on your left? Who cares who's on your right? If you need to get right with the Lord, come forward. And as we sing, if you just if you just want if you're staying in your seat and you're not coming forward, pray with somebody, pray for somebody, or just sing to the Lord like you've never sung to the Lord before. Amen. Hallelujah. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching this video. Listen, please share this with a friend. Uh, send it to somebody that you think might, might like it. Help us spread this word uh, to people that would be inspired like you have been, be impacted like you have just been. And, uh, and subscribe. If y'all would subscribe to our YouTube channel, it sure does help out a lot, reach more people. Um, so if you like this content, hit that subscribe button. Hit the notification thing so that you can be updated when we put new stuff out. And, and help us continue to reach as many people as possible. Thanks again so much for watching this. I hope it blessed you. We'll see you again soon.